In the last video on the channel, I showed you this spectacular win by Levon Aronian in the final of the Gold Money Asian Rapid. So Aronian had white here, just a quick recap, and Artemiev broke with f5. Now, this is a critical moment in the game. Can white handle the advance of those pawns? Aronian took, which opens up potential diagonals here and e-file and then e4 and now Aronian came up with this spectacular idea giving up a piece taking here took on g7 and then sacrificed the rook and d6 and well he managed to clatter through it was a wonderful game and this actually reminded me of one of my own games said with all modesty so i'd like to show you that game and it's interesting to, to compare and contrast so let me just find that so this was played in 2004 in the british national league the, the four ncl uh, my opponent opponent um i think his name is thomas nixon and uh, well he's kind of a, a promising junior so this one starts out as a Spanish. Now, what I'll do is I'll just go through these opening moves fairly quickly. I also might uh, remind you of some of the, the games that I looked at in the Spanish. I mean, the, these themes are so typical. So, so far, it's a main line. And here my opponent plays d6. So this is a, a closed variation. doesn't go for the marshal. And c3. And now you, you can just castle here, but he went knight a5 straight away. Of course, I preserve that incredibly powerful bishop, or potentially powerful bishop. Um, that's really important in the Spanish. And so I construct my center. I don't need to play h3 here. There's no real pressure on d4. Don't need to worry about bishop g4. Queen c7. It's a slightly unusual move order from my opponent, but um, it's a typical Spanish position. And now there's a little bit of pressure here, and I decided to close it. I do like these closed central positions where you can try to play on the king side using that space advantage. The bishop comes back, so I've got a bit of sorting out to do on the queen side. And a5, otherwise that knight would be trapped. Knight f1, of course, the knight starts its journey to one of these squares, usually g3. g6, I think it's a little bit premature, but, well, very often the move gets played anyway. Bishop d3, so I'm sorting out my pieces, and I can bring my rook to the c-file. Queen has to keep hold of that pawn. Bishop b3, knocks the queen back. h3. I don't want to run into knight g4. Castles. And here, well, I've got to make a decision about how or and where I play on the board. Felt as though black was pretty well organised on the queen side, and it's the king side where I should be looking. Particularly as the queen is over on the other side of the board, and that makes it more attractive to switch to the king side. So how do we get play going? Well... G4 is the kind of move that um, a lot of people like to play in these sort of positions, but I actually didn't see the point of it. It's not going to break open any files, and, and actually can be met by H5. Um, I prefer to play with my pieces, knight G3, which doesn't look like it's going anywhere for the moment, but, well, just watch out. Uh, things can happen with that knight. And it supports the e-pawn, and one never knows. On a good day, it might find itself leaping to one of these squares. So my opponent played knight e8. So queen d2, no no need to rush things at the moment. So just keeps an eye on that pawn and is on a, <clears throat> it's on a nice diagonal. Knight g7, so you can see that he's perhaps looking to break with f5. And of course this is a critical move. It can be very good for black if these pawns start rolling down the board, if, if you get in f4. So I think when you're playing the white side of the Spanish, you have to be really alert to this and just consider how, how are you dealing with this, basically. 
Now I put my bishop back on b1. That sort of preempts one of these moves. And actually now I could be threatening to take here. So my opponent dropped the bishop back to d8. But already, you know, I was calculating what happens after f5. This, as I said, is the critical move. But I judge this should be okay for me. I don't want to allow the position to be closed on the king side. Obviously, f4 is a threat anyway. But my intention was to take, and after pawn takes, play either bishop h6 or bishop g5. Um, something similar happens in the game. We, 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 let's, uh, so let's move on and see what happens. So bishop b1, and my opponent played bishop d8, which I think is a good move. Not only does it protect the pawn on a5, but also the bishop wants to bounce out to b6, which comes on to an excellent diagonal, maybe exchanging bishops. Right, so how does white get things going on the king side? Well, I need a pawn break here. Um, it's clear that white isn't going to get very far just by, by playing bishop h6, although that's kind of a useful move. Um, but I was looking to play f4, which is the sort of standard move in these kind of positions. I think if you look at some of my other videos on the Spanish on the channel, you'll know that this is a very common idea, particularly when there's no knight to land on e5. So f4 starts to break things open. And here, I think it probably would have been best for my opponent to play bishop b6. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get in f4 at some point, but um, I, I think it's reasonable for black. Instead, my opponent played this incredibly sharp move. Now, this is make or break. It could be incredibly strong. And of course, I had to foresee this position and think, how am I going to deal with that move? One of my first thoughts was actually to continue with f4 anyway. But there's a problem with this. I was very worried about g5, an extraordinary counter. And if pawn takes pawn, well, either a pawn takes pawn, then f4 winning a piece. Now, it is very complicated, but I didn't get a good vibe about that. So instead, I took on f5. Now, if knight takes, there, there simply isn't the danger there because those pawns don't get to roll down the board. So pawn takes is obviously the critical move. Just you know, establishing these two pawns in the middle, and they can threaten to roll down the board. Um, well, if not sooner than later, perhaps you know, after sorting pieces out, maybe bishop out here and then rook over. But already f4 is a threat anyway. So I played bishop h6. I think the important thing is when you're dealing with these kind of pawns, on each turn you have to consider what happens if the pawns are pushed. So, for example, if f4, well, I wasn't worried about that because it opens this up. And, you know, uh, of course, you can always, you know, consider queen d3 as an option. But if nothing else, then knight e4 just sits the knight on a, on a beautiful square. So f4 just isn't right for all kinds of reasons. Um, what about e4? Well, I can break that up with f3. And a position like this, you can see that black's king side is looking pretty ragged, actually. What about knight c5? That sort of throws the knight into a good position. But here, well, I was looking at taking here and just sacking the exchange. And that felt pretty good, actually. Just blasting through the middle and, well... Depends how quickly the knight can come back in, but it felt like pretty good compensation. My opponent played the knight back to c7. Now, he's putting pressure on the d5 pawn, but also might come back to support the knight on g7. So I just played the rook to d1 to support the d pawn. And he flipped the knight back to e8 to lend support to some support to the knight on g7. And here I considered playing f4, but he might just close the position with e4. But in the end, I went for knight f3. I thought this was more dangerous. So my idea is to try and flip the knight into g5. And there it just looks really dangerous looking at these two points. And of course, can't be driven away. 
So the position is reaching boiling point. My opponent pushed with e4. And I went in with knight g5, which I, I felt was, was good for me. I just felt like things were heading in the right direction. And here, well, my opponent played bishop f6, but I had a moment of panic, actually, when I realized my opponent could play rook f6, hitting that bishop. And of course, it can't move anywhere. And I don't certainly don't want to play bishop takes knight, giving up that beautiful bishop, dark square bishop. But actually, I started looking at this pawn sacrifice. That's interesting. But the one that I was really tempted by was this move. And it's sort of very typical of these positions where you've just got to blast your way through and you know open up that diagonal. Of course, now the bishop is protected by the queen. And I just felt that I would have good compensation here. And actually, the computer confirms that um, with the move g4 just taking that square away from black's pieces and threatening queen d3 and with that queen yes dare i say it way off in siberia then i mean white's attack along this diagonal is irresistible actually it's a tremendous position beautiful centralization i really like that but yeah i must admit i was kind of panicking a bit after i saw rook f6 hitting the bishop thinking i really don't want to give that bishop up but yeah, the sacrifice was very tempting. Anyway, my opponent played, you could say, a more normal move, bishop f6. And that one I had anticipated and was looking forward to. Knight e6. The knight is thrown in. So what that does is gets rid of that important light squared bishop that supports this pawn chain, basically. Of course, the pawn can't be taken because of this, the pin. And... I mean, given, you know, a few moves in a row, if black could play bishop e5, queen over, queen takes e6, then, well, if you can maintain that pawn structure in the middle, then black would be doing well, but it just takes time to shift everything over. And here I can blast through with knight takes f5. And then bishop takes pawn, you can see... <laughs> Black is in massive trouble here. Queen a7. Well, I didn't bother taking that one. I wanted to keep going on the king side. Bishop takes rook. Knight takes. And now rook takes bishop. There you go. <laughs> uh, Levon's game was, a, was a, a little bit of an echo of this game, dare I say it, with this rook takes bishop. Pawn takes rook. And now queen g5 check. And... This is instant destruction. The knight blocked and rook d7 was 1-0 because after the queen moves, then rook takes g7. Well, he's just mating a couple of moves. Um, I have to say, I rather enjoyed that. It all came sort of, I came clattering through, came through with a real crescendo at the end. But just um, <clears throat> on a serious note, these, I mean, this uh, arose from a Spanish uh, the Aronian and Artemiev game came from a modern, but actually the structure was very, very similar. And this is such a typical scenario in the Spanish where you have to deal with those center pawns um, and you know you try to generate peace activity. It's very, very typical. So do watch out for that in your games. There's going to be loads more coming up on the channel over the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, there's going to be some new merch watch out for that uh, there'll be an announcement about new merch coming soon um we've got the fide world cup coming uh there's kasparov is going to be playing in a in a, uh, in, a in a tournament soon that's that's going to be interesting um I've, I've got some patreon videos to record i'm just catching up with all my work after the commentary so patrons I appreciate your support. Uh, newsletter and videos coming soon. Haven't forgotten about it. Just got lots to do. And I uh, hope you all enjoy the channel. Thanks for watching.